Hello everyone. Welcome, welcome back. I'm Chris. This is uh, this was requested. Uh, Napoleon's greatest comeback, the Battle of. I want to say Margino. But I'm just saying that because it looks good. Maring Marengo. Margino. I'm gonna stick with that. It's wrong. We're gonna stick with it. Um, like I say, this was requested. See me click that thumbs up. If you could do the same, that helps out tremendously. You can uh, subscribe to the channel. So, just like I did. And you can uh, donate to the channel through the thanks button. Just like that. Uh, if you donate, you request a video, your name is sponsoring that video. It's a little thank you. Uh, you can still request without donating. You just don't get the shout out. Like this was requested by somebody. That's the best to get. It's just a benefit. Doesn't mean anything to you. It's fine with me. But all donations are appreciated. So, let's get into this. 27 minutes. I was looking at it. This will be one video because it's. I'll, 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 sh I'll stop on the ad. So, but there's another one I'm doing next that I will have to break down in two videos. But that doesn't matter now. Let's get to the video. The 13th of June, 1800. Napoleon Bonaparte, first consul of France has just pulled off one of history's boldest maneuvers. He has marched his army over the ice-covered Alps to arrive behind the Austrian army in Italy. He has captured Milan and defeated every enemy force he's met so far. Everything is going as planned. Now, Napoleon spreads his forces in a wide cordon to prevent the escape of General Melas's Austrian army. General Chabrin and 3,400 men guard the River Po. General Lapoix, with 3,500 men, is sent to reinforce him. General Dessay, with 5,000 men, moves south to block the road to Genoa. This leaves Napoleon with just 22,000 men advancing west onto the plains of Scrivia. But the first consul has been misled by the over-optimistic reports of scouts and spies. Melas is not planning to retreat. He has concentrated 30,000 veteran troops around the fortress city of Alessandria. They are well-rested, supplied, and have a great superiority in cavalry and artillery. And they are preparing to attack. Oblivious to the looming threat, on the 13th of June, General Victor and his two divisions lead the French advance on Alessandria. In heavy rain, his men drive a small Austrian rearguard from the village of Marengo, back towards a fortified bridgehead on the Bormida River. But the French find the crossing heavily defended. And so, soaked and exhausted, with darkness falling, they halt the pursuit. Weeks ago, Napoleon had predicted that the decisive battle of the campaign would be fought on this very ground, the plain east of Alessandria. But now, he is convinced that Melas will not risk battle. What he and his men cannot see beyond the Bormida, because they have lit no campfires, are 30,000 Austrians assembled for an assault. Within hours, Napoleon will discover that his army is fighting for its life. Dawn, the 14th of June. Napoleon's forces are spread across eight miles of open country and scattered vineyards. General Victor's two divisions are the farthest west, 
holding Marengo and the main road. Behind him, General Lan and several cavalry regiments. Napoleon, with the Consular Guard and Moniere's division, is yet further back. Melas's forces are concentrated west of the Bormida, behind the Austrian bridgehead. His chief of staff, General Anton von Zach, has planned a two-pronged assault. General Ott's division will cross the river and advance north to Castel Ceriolo. Melas, with the bulk of the army, will attack directly up the main road. On a clear morning, at 8 a.m., the Austrians begin their advance. French outposts are driven back. At the Pedra Bona farm, Gardin's division comes under heavy bombardment. He falls back to join the rest of Victor's troops, which are deploying behind the Fontanone stream. This narrow, steep-sided waterway runs the length of the battlefield and is swollen by recent rain. The only easy crossing is a small wooden bridge at the main road. And on the far bank, Victor's men are shielded by trees and sturdy farmhouses. As the Austrians approach the Fontanoni, they are hit by a hail of musket fire. Scores go down as they struggle to cross the stream. General Haddick. I was going to say, why are you positioning yourself with a stream in front of you? But with the trees and everything like that, and it's swollen. Okay. It's, it's not like it's going to be an impossible thing to cross. But it's it's went from a stream to a looks like a small river which is going to make it a little more difficult so i i understand that now maybe the the painting helps but and doesn't it seem like most people back in those days just didn't swim you know something like this crossing like this it seems like a lot of people would probably drown now it's maybe it's because they're they're lugging heavy equipment i don't know but it always seems like they always drowned. Leads a charge, but falls mortally wounded. After several failed attacks, the Austrians fall back with heavy losses. North of Victor's position, General Belgard's brigade crosses the Fontanone around 11 a.m. But General Land's division takes up position on Victor's flank. They drive off Belgarde and re-establish the line along the stream. It is now a hot, humid summer's day, as Austrian attacks continue and fighting rages along the Fontanone. More and more Austrian cannon are pulled up and begin to pulverize the French line. Throughout the morning, Melas's army is hindered by narrow crossing points and marshy ground. General Zach's failure to anticipate these bottlenecks has cost several hours. Nevertheless, by noon, the Austrians have 30,000 men and 92 guns in position. They still only face Lannes and Victor's tiring divisions, 16,000 men and 16 guns. The French urgently need reinforcements, but as the Austrians begin their next attack, Napoleon and the rest of the army are nowhere to be seen. Where are these guys going? I thought they were going to come across and come down, but I'm going to guess they're probably kind of going to come behind and encircle them. And I see one guy here. One little French unit that's like, yeah, we tried. 
The greatest danger is on the French right, where General Ott's division has occupied Castel Ceriolo virtually unopposed, and now threatens Land's flank. Then the Austrians find a gap near the French centre, and rush three battalions across the Fontanone. Around the same time, 1,500 Austrian dragoons circle around the French left, but are charged and routed by General Kellermann's heavy cavalry. The Austrians do succeed in taking La Stortiliona farm, threatening Victor's left. An Austrian cavalry charge over the Marengo bridge is also repulsed by Kellermann. But the odds are too great. Some French units are completely out of ammunition. They have just a handful of cannon, and their line is breaking. Facing encirclement, Victor's divisions are the first to give way, losing 400 men captured in Marengo. Another 300 French soldiers are left behind in Casabianca, where they hold out stubbornly for several hours. Covered by the 96th Demi Brigade and Kellermann's watchful cavalry, Victor's division retreats half a mile to Spinetta and its surrounding vineyards. The Austrians pour over the Fontanone. Lann pulls back to maintain the French line. The heroes of Montebello are on the brink. Did he, was he so far behind, you know, maybe not expecting the battle to start, and then he heard probably the cannon and the, the gunshots, and then he, you know, hurried up and got there? Or was he just so far behind? Because I thought it said he was two miles behind, which, I mean... Two miles is two miles if you're walking. So yeah, it's. I'm one. I'm. I don't think he was expecting a fight then. I don't know. Who am I? When the Austrian attack began, Napoleon was seven miles away at his headquarters in Torre Garofoli. So I'm guessing he seven miles away. He must not have expected it at all. I like the map here to show how far away, but yet it seems so close at the same time. Although he could hear the distant thunder of cannon, he did not grasp its full significance and remained focused on blocking the Austrians' escape. Only at 11... Oh, he, he probably figured we're winning, so I got to figure out how to stop. He didn't figure they were retreating or, you know, setting up new lines. Interesting. So his entire plan right now is, is it's a moot point. He's got to come in and rescue. AM did reports arrive to reveal the gravity of the situation. Napoleon knows there is not a moment to lose. He scrawls an order to Dessay, who he sent to cut off the Austrian retreat and is now four miles away. I had thought to attack the enemy. They have attacked me. Come in the name of God, if you still can. He sends the same order to General Lapoix. Then he races to the front with his only reserves, Monnier's division and the Consular Guard. By 3 p.m., Lann and Victor have retreated almost a mile. Austrian cavalry shadow their withdrawal, forcing the French to stay in close formation. Austrian guns send round shot crashing through the packed ranks. Remarkably, the French battalions are still holding. When Napoleon arrives, 
He sees the main threat is on the right, where Ott is poised to turn the French flank. To counter this, he sends Monnier's division to Castelceriolo, forcing Ott to draw off troops. But that still leaves General Schellenberg's 4,000-strong division. So Napoleon commits his ultimate reserve, 900 men of the elite Consular Guard. Against the odds, the Guard repels enemy cavalry and holds its own in a close-range firefight with Austrian infantry. I love that painting. Oh, I love that painting. It's this guy right here that does it. Hmm. They, they love mustaches, didn't they? Look at that. Can't tell this if this guy has a mustache, but if he doesn't, he's probably not going to live very long. You got to have a mustache to survive war. That's what I've heard. Don't fact check that. Buying time for the rest of the army to fall back. Napoleon describes them as his granite redoubt. The legend of the guard is being born. But they are now isolated and about to be overwhelmed. When Austrian dragoons hit their exposed flank and rear, the redoubt crumbles. The guard is forced to flee. Some surrender, many are cut down. By the end of the day, the guard has suffered more than 50% casualties. With the retreat of the guard, Napoleon has no more cards left to play. The French army retreats steadily through the vineyards, battered by constant Austrian artillery fire. Casualties and stragglers mean there are just 6,000 men left holding the French line. General Melas is satisfied that the French have been beaten. Having been injured in a fall from his horse, he now hands over command to his chief of staff, General Zack. Then he returns to Alessandria to draft a report describing his great victory. But he has underestimated French resilience and the fickle fortunes of war. General Louis Dessay, just 31 years old, brave, brilliant, and modest. Napoleon describes their friendship as one his heart has for no other. That morning, his orders were to lead Boudet's division, 5,000 strong, across the Scrivia River to cut off the Austrian escape. But the recent rain had raised the water level and delayed his crossing. When Dessay heard the sound of battle to the north, he'd halted his men and sent a courier to get news. Napoleon's desperate order to return does not reach him until midday. Immediately, he about turns his division and marches to the sound of the guns. Dessay arrives on the eastern edge of the battlefield at 5 p.m to find the French army in full retreat. Napoleon is at San Giuliano, five miles east of Marengo, where thousands of wounded soldiers are gathered. The mood is grim and despondent. But news of Desay's arrival spreads like an electric shock. Here they are, here they are, the troops exclaim. Napoleon is rejuvenated 
We have gone back far enough today, he tells his troops. You know that my custom is always to sleep on the field of battle. The Austrian army is advancing on all fronts, but they are now scattered and disordered, and they have diverted forces north and south in an attempt to encircle the enemy. What's more, General Zack has advanced to lead the pursuit, handing overall command to General Keim. Several other Austrian generals have been wounded chains of command have become dangerously muddled. Using Dessay's fresh troops, Napoleon now prepares a last-ditch counterattack, with all the supporting forces he can rally. General Marmont concentrates all the available guns, 18 of them, to blast the Austrians. Then, with the 9th Light Demi Brigade in the lead, the attack begins. The rapid fire of these experienced skirmishers staggers the Austrian advance. General Zack orders up more artillery and sends forward his elite grenadiers. He has to be a little confused because he just had the French on the ropes, you know, what I mean? like they're chasing him down. And then they get to a point and now they've got the French charging them. So he has to think, maybe it's a last stand to try to get Napoleon safe or something. But I have a feeling it's about to hit him in waves. And the fresh troops, man, that's that's a mental lift. Because both sides have been fighting all day. And now you have fresh troops that just want to get into the battle. And I mean, the other side's going to be exhausted. And that those fresh troops, the, when they're on your side, that's going to you know invigorate you, motivate you, get you hyped up and get back into it. But yeah, the, I'm just this he has to be at a loss. like why are they, they're attacking us now? He has to be completely confused. Or he's thinking that Napoleon has got some miraculous trick up his sleeve which is also possible. The Ninth Light falls back. To the Austrians, it seems the French are retreating once more. Suddenly, they are blindsided by the rest of Dessay's fresh troops, emerging without warning through the vineyards. Dessay joins the Ninth Light and leads them forward in a bayonet charge. At this moment, he is shot through the heart and killed instantly. Seeing their commander fall, the Ninth Light cries, Vengeance! and surges forward. General Kellerman thunders in with 400 heavy cavalry. They crash into the Austrian left flank. To add to the chaos, an Austrian ammunition wagon is hit and detonates in a tremendous explosion. The combined effect is devastating. Panic spreads, morale collapses. In just a few minutes, hundreds of Austrians lay down their arms and surrender. Thousands more flee, spreading terror among troops in the rear. General Zack, trapped in the rout, is among the 2,000 Austrian prisoners. In an instant, the entire momentum of the battle has swung 180 degrees. Thousands of French troops who'd been retreating moments ago stop and join the attack. As the Austrian centre collapses, General Ott's division becomes dangerously exposed. 
His men soon joined the rest of the army in their race to escape. Later that evening, General Murat adds the coup de grace, launching a final French cavalry charge that seals victory and drives the enemy back to their bridgehead. The Battle of Marengo was one of the greatest comebacks of the Napoleonic era. Thoroughly defeated by mid-afternoon, the French are completely victorious by nightfall. But it has been an exceptionally costly affair. The French lose a quarter of their army as casualties. The Austrians, more than a third. Napoleon himself contributed little to the victory. If not for the skill of his officers, the steadiness of his troops, and above all, Desai's last-minute arrival, he would surely have been defeated. The taste of victory is soured further when Napoleon learns that his friend, Desai, has been killed. He tells his secretary, Yes, Bourrienne, I am satisfied. But Desai, ah, what a triumph this would have been if I could have embraced him. tonight on the field of battle. Instead, he dines alone. According to legend, on a hastily improvised dish of local ingredients that becomes known as chicken marengo. General Melas, shaken by his unexpected defeat, is unsure how to react. Some of his officers urge him to continue fighting. Others advise him to escape. French forces are closing in from all directions. Hoping to buy time, Melas proposes a ceasefire to bury the dead. Napoleon refuses, unless Melas is also willing to discuss terms for the Austrian evacuation of northwest Italy. With little bargaining leverage, the old Austrian general accepts. Over the following days, Melas and Berthier negotiate a comprehensive armistice. In exchange for safe passage back to Austria, Melas agrees to evacuate Piedmont, Genoa and Lombardy. France will once more dominate northern Italy. Napoleon has achieved his victory and cemented his position as France's new head of state. What's more, the near miraculous manner of his victory assures him more than ever of his own special destiny. The gods of war and fortune are with him. What limit can there be to his accomplishments? That winter, Moreau inflicts a second crushing defeat on the Austrians at the Battle of Hohenlinden. Defeated in Italy, and now Germany too, Austria finally sues for peace. The subsequent Treaty of Lunéville sees the French frontier advance to the River Rhine. In Italy, French client republics are officially recognised by Austria. And the following year, France annexes Piedmont. France is now larger and stronger than at any time since the reign of Charlemagne a thousand years ago. She has just one remaining enemy, Great Britain. In 1801, British victories at Alexandria and Copenhagen drive home the fact that France cannot challenge Britain at sea nor abroad. Britain has seen her continental allies defeated, and Russia is now actually threatening war. She has no prospect of building another coalition to challenge France on land. Both sides are exhausted by war. The result? After months of negotiation, peace. For the first time in Europe in 10 years.
how long it will last, nobody is quite sure. Do you think you could replicate Napoleon? No, I could not um, replicate anything Napoleon did. Wow. I, I just to say, just so I forgot the guy's name. 31 year old getting shot right through the heart, leading his men into battle. That one hurts. And then Napoleon dining alone. That got me too. I kind of felt like, oh, poor guy. But that's war, right? Okay, well, we're going to end this here. I hope you enjoyed. I'm going to do another one of these in two parts. But until then, have a good day, have a good night.